17? 17 sounds good to me. Let's do some public policy. No, oh, should just be social policy, shouldn't it? We did economic policy last time. All right. We are recording. There we go. All right, we should be good. So, there we go. All right, so we're looking at social policy today. Uh, social policy, what we're talking about really is um, social programs. Um, a lot of the times is referred to in the United States as the welfare state. Um, that's really sort of a loaded term. It depends on um, where you fall on the political spectrum as to whether or not you believe that this is welfare or if it's just general like um, social safety nets, right? Uh, but this is what you talk about when you talk about democratic, democratic socialist countries, uh, which is sort of an oxymoron. It doesn't really exist. Um, in fact, most of your Scandinavian countries that are the model example of democratic socialism will actually tell you um, that, that they're not democratically socialist countries. Uh, they're simply democratic countries with a large social safety net. Um, and that's really what social policy is aimed at here, what we're talking about, right? So it's governmental programs aimed at helping the, the poor, right? A lot of this comes out of the Great Depression. Uh, and ultimately the Great Depression is sort of the turning point uh, of the creation of the modern sort of, um, again, I'm gonna use the term welfare state, but that's a little bit of a loaded term, just understand that. Okay. Um, I, I don't care a ton about the history of it here, um, but here's basically what I need you to understand. Um, Prior to the Great Depression, um, we still had a social safety net. That social safety net was predominantly private, and it was run by churches and charities. As there are still a, a, a large percentage of people that would like to see us return to that sort of churches and, and charities uh, concept. Um, with that, you have... Uh, some separation between what we call the deserving poor and the undeserving poor, uh, which really just gets into um, some really, really loaded things like, uh, you know, uh, somebody with alcoholism, for instance, would be undeserving poor um, because that's their own fault. Um, you know, somebody that was um, of loose moral character, right? Like, um, which, which would be a, a, a way of saying in 1926 that a woman got knocked up outside of wedlock, right, before she got married. That makes her of loose moral character. Um, she is undeserving poor, right? Um, deserving poor are, are you know, widows, uh, orphans, um, you know, people like that. That's, that's a little bit different. Um, by the Great Depression, um, we begin to realize that sort of the concept of undeserving poor is a little misleading and unfair, uh, especially when we consider that the undeserving poor are, are people that we think should be capable of working but are simply not working. Um, obviously, when you have uh, during the Great Depression, you have unemployment as high as 25%. Um, that means that, uh, you know, there's all sorts of able bodied, capable men. Um, they would love to have a job, they just can't find one. Okay. Um, you also have what are called means tests. Um, a means test is a program that you have to qualify for. Uh, and when we talk about sort of the modern social safety net, modern social policy, there is a difference between means tested programs and non means tested programs, right? So a means tested program is a program that you have to qualify for, um, i.e., WIC. Right, WIC is women, infants, and children. Uh, that's sustenance uh, uh, aid, right? Money for food and things like that um, for women, infants, and children of a certain wealth category, right? Like poor uh, women, infants, and children. 
they have to qualify for that. Uh, on the other hand, Social Security uh, is you, you don't have to qualify for Social Security. Um, Bill Gates and his billions of dollars is going to be able to get Social Security, right? Um, even though he really, really shouldn't need it. And um, the Great Depression, obviously, it sees the massive, massive increase uh, in unemployment and economic uh, sort of despair, uh, which then leads to sort of a twofold problem, right? One, if, if churches and charities are the predominant source of our social safety net prior to the Great Depression, and then we have massive unemployment, and so we have a significant increase, massive, massive, massive increase in the number of people needing assistance, and a massive decrease in the amount of wealth that exists, that means that people are also giving less to charities and churches, which detrimentally affects their ability to help people. Okay? Uh, so it's really sort of twofold. Um, and then when you consider that shortly after the Great Depression begins, because the Great Depression really begins in 1929 with the stock market crash, uh, in the early 1930s, uh, we have the banking crisis. Um, and so banks basically go bankrupt and people that had money in the bank uh, lose everything, right? Um, so there goes their sort of personal social safety net, right? Or their, their personal safety net. Um, and so we now realize that people that are poor, it's not always a byproduct of like poor decisions on their part. And okay? uh, so we create sort of the modern welfare state uh, under FDR. Um, and, and there's a couple of different programs that are created initially. Um, one is Social Security, which is a, a forced savings account, basically. Um, you can't opt out of it. You, 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 when you start working, um, you will give money to Social Security every paycheck, uh, whether you want to or not. Um, and then theoretically, that money is, again, it says forced savings. Um, it goes into an account, and theoretically, um, you know, when you're old and you're retired, uh, you'll get paid back out of Social Security. Uh, the reality is that that won't happen. That won't happen for your generation. It won't happen for my generation. Um, Social Security will go bankrupt long before then because the U.S. borrows against Social Security um, and all sorts of other things, which is, and and you have uh, the baby boomers that are about to start retiring in mass, um, and you have increases in life expectancy. So people are pulling Social Security significantly longer than what people originally took into account. Um, now, with that, you also have to realize that the, the amount that you're pulling for Social Security is also not uh, necessarily equitable, right? So um, you pay money into Social Security every month, um, and you're paying in, let's say, you know, let's take my grandfather, for instance, right? So my grandfather is a Korean War veteran, right? Um, so he was born in 1933, I believe, right? Um, so, is that right? 32, I think he turns 89 this year. I think he's born in 32, okay? So uh, my great, or my grandfather, not great grandfather, my grandfather born in 1932, um, he joined the Navy, okay? Um, and then gets out of the Navy and, and goes to college um, and, and works as a pharmacist. And so he's paying money into Social Security, but he's paying money in uh, based upon the, 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 the amount of money that he is making in 1958, right? Um, and so obviously in 1958, you know, we, we talked about inflation at least a little bit. We know that the dollar is very different, right? So he's probably paying, um, you know, two or three dollars uh, into Social Security every paycheck. Um, and now he's pulling um, you know, probably eight or nine hundred dollars uh, a month out of that, right? Which is obviously substantially more than what he paid in. Uh, part of that is inflationary. Um, part of it is because we do have adjustments um, that come with Social Security periodically to ensure um, that people are, are are pulling out enough to make it sustainable, so that they can actually survive off of it. Um, if, if, I mean, if, literally, if we gave old people like 150 bucks a month at this point, like what's, there's no point in that, right? At that point, you're going to give somebody $150 a month in retirement, you might as well give them nothing and call it that because you're not allowing them to, to, to survive off of that. Um, one of the modifications that we have are called COLAs, which is a cost of living adjustment, um, which is, again, takes into account inflation and things like that. Um, 
Let's see, Medicare and Medicaid are a part of it. Um, these are not Great Depression era uh, entitlements. Rather, they come out of the Johnson administration in the 1960s as a result of LBJ's uh, War on Poverty, right, which is this very broad, generalized war on um, or attempt, I don't want to say war, war is the wrong term. We call it a war. Um, you can't win a war on poverty. Poverty is always going to exist. You can't eradicate it. Um, so to call it a war is a little bit of a misconception. Uh, but the idea here is to try to uh, create programs that will aid um, specifically the poorest amongst us and the poorest regions. Um, again, I come from West Virginia, which is one of the poorest regions um, of the United States. And, and FDRs, excuse me, not FDR, LBJs, uh, war on poverty was aimed largely at trying to help sort of coal mining West Virginia um, and, and those and those programs, right? So Medicare, care goes to old people, right? So it's basically health insurance for old people because right now the vast majority of Americans get their health insurance from their job, right? Um, and so when you stop working, you lose health insurance. Okay, now there's a lot of jobs where you can continue to pay into it and you can keep your health insurance, but you can pay for it. Um, Medicare, on the other hand, uh, you're paying a tax. That Medicare tax then provides you with some sort of health insurance in your retirement, right? So you have Medicare for your health insurance and Social Security for your retirement and you're fine. Medicaid, on the other hand, uh, Medicaid is uh, aid or, or, or health care for poor people, right? Uh, the way that I remember that, the way that I look at the difference between that care, old people need constant care because they're about to die. Poor people need aid, they need assistance. Um, so that's how I sort of um, deal with that. Non-contributory programs are programs that you don't actually have to pay into every month, right? Like you pay into Medicare every month, you pay into Social Security every month. Non-contributory programs are things that we actually think of when we think of quote unquote welfare, right? Um, so SNAP is one of them, which is the Supplemental Nutritional Assistance Program, uh, which is kind of what we think of when we think of like welfare, um, right? Uh, food stamps, things like that. Those are programs that you don't pay into, right? You don't get money taken out of your taxes every month for them, but um, you do get those benefits provided that you qualify them, qualify for them. Again, so these are means tested programs. Medicaid is another one, right? Um, so Medicaid is something that you get uh, if you qualify for it, but you have to qualify for Medicaid, right? Um, and you you have to, it's, it's not necessarily an easy thing to qualify for. Now um, the, the term down here that, that you really need to understand is entitlement. This term gets thrown around. Um, a whole lot. Entitlements, it's a, it's a little bit of a, a, a loaded term, um, but obviously you, you know what being entitled means, right? Like you understand conceptually, if you're entitled to something, um, it means that you're, you're obligated, like you did, it's yours. Um, Social Security is an entitlement in that regard. You're entitled to it, you paid into it your whole life. Um, it'll be sad that you won't get Social Security. Um, it will be sad, sadder for my generation who's paid into it for the majority of their working life that will not get it. Um, but entitlement programs are programs that the government is required to make payments on. Um, and, and the vast majority of the time, government is required to make these payments based upon what previous governments have done. And when I say previous governments, I mean Congress right now, they pass an annual budget. These entitlements are things that they can't ch touch or change. They're payments that they are already required to make before they sit down to do the budget in the first place. Part of the problem with entitlements, especially if you listen to Republicans, is that entitlements eat up more and more and more and more of our budget every single year. And the entitlement spending within the U.S. government, within our, our, our sort of uh, budgeting process now eats up, I think between entitlements and uh, interest payments on the debt, that accounts for almost or roughly 70% of our federal budget. 
seven of every ten dollars that we spend goes to either entitlements or to the debt and which means that we get three dollars out of every ten to build roads or pay for the military and out of that three dollars generally like two goes to the military um but it, it just gives you an idea of, of sort of how little um, is, is left over as a result of that. Um, there is some variation between the national government and state governments, and I'm not going to go into a ton of detail with that. This really is a, a sort of national government class. Um, but some states, some states do have uh, some autonomy in terms of how they do things. And so when we go back to the very beginning of the semester, we have, remember that term federalism, right? Federalism is, is the separation of power within a national and state level. Um, sometimes states take some of this, the monies for social welfare fair programs and try to uh, do new things or implement new programs to see how they work. Um, one state, and I forget that it might have been Vermont, I forget the state now off the top of my head, um, they decided that they were going to implement drug testing for uh, for unemployment benefits, right? Um, so that way, like you couldn't you couldn't just sit around and get high all day and lay on your couch and get unemployment. Um, ultimately, and it sounds like a great idea, right? Like, yeah, because I don't want to give drug dealers and drug addicts unemployment. Like that's just just like feeding their drug habit. Um, but ultimately, what we realized is is a percentage of people failing the drug test was so small uh, that the amount of money that you were saving and not providing payments to the drug users was less than the cost of the drug testing, right? So you're actually losing money. You're losing money by drug testing all of these people who are not failing tests, right? Um, so some states do have some variation in terms of how they do things. Uh, and, and some states also vary in terms of how much they give um, for something like uh, TANF, which is Temporary Assistance for Needy Families. Um, obviously, if you're on like a temporary assistance as a needy family in whole West Virginia, um, you're gonna need a different sort of amount of income in order to sustain life than if you're in Manhattan, right? Or Brooklyn or somewhere in New York City where it's uh, significantly more expensive, right? Um, so this is just this is just a graph that shows you uh, sort of which states pay the most and which states pay the least. Um, and obviously, it shouldn't surprise you that like New York and California are in red; they're fairly high. Uh, most of your southern states here are in that orangish color, uh, which is fairly low, right? Uh, southern states it's generally cheaper to live in the south than it is um, in New England or along the west coast, right? Um, there are some complications um, in, in the welfare state as it pertains to taxing as well. Um, and, and this is actually one of the things where, where, where like liberals will tell you, uh, and they're not wrong. They're not wrong when they say this, that when they talk about like um, the welfare state, the welfare state actually benefits rich people more than it benefits poor people, right? And I know what you're thinking, like we just talked about means tested programs and we've talked about things like that. And if we really got into social security in enough detail, you would understand that like, um, like really, really rich people pay more into social security than poor people, yet you get the same amount out, which obviously benefits poor more than it benefits rich. Um, but the reality is, is that there are also all sorts of things that can be written off on your taxes. Um, and because middle, upper middle class, upper class typically have disposable income, they can save for their own retirement and they can write things like that off on their taxes. That's benefiting them obviously far more than it's benefiting poor people who can't do those things. Okay. Um, when it does come for to, to paying for these things, um, obviously as I mentioned a minute ago, um, the spending on it has gone up drastically and it's increased significantly and it's going to continue to increase significantly, uh, especially Social Security because that's, um, that's, that's the biggest uh, expenditure in all of this. Um, but a lot of this also comes from payroll taxes. And payroll taxes uh, are, are taxes basically from, from your, your job. And, and, and there's, there are uh, stipulations within tax code where uh, 
the, the businesses themselves have to meet um, some of those contributions that you make as the employee that you see coming out of your individual taxes. Um, the, the employer uh, has to, to pay some of those as well, right? Um, again, it's really difficult to control the spending uh, on entitlement programs in large part because like I said, uh, when Congress meets to do their budget every year, um, those entitlement spendings, those, those, those monies that are earmarked for these entitlements have already been spent by previous Congresses, uh, which is why in order to try to offset for the future, sometimes Congress will uh, implement things like changes to the retirement age. Um, I believe when Social Security was first created, you could pull Social Security at 60, right? Um, now you can't get Social Security, I believe, until 65. Um, but they, they, they actually have a higher, uh, you, can, you can get more monthly from Social Security if you wait even longer to retire. Uh, and, and these are things that are, are created by Congress in order to try to slow the rising tide of these costs. Okay, um, this is obviously just a graph that shows you sort of the, the, the costs of uh, your various entitlements and, 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 and what, is, what is causing more. Um, I will say this, it's, it's a little hard to tell from this graph, uh, but Medicare, um, while it is not obviously the largest contributor, um, is growing very, very rapidly um, because healthcare costs in the United States are growing very, very rapidly. Um, in large part, and, and not that you really need to know this, um, but in large part because the money that goes into research for medical purposes predominantly goes into research for old people, right? And trying to prolong those last 10 years of life and turn those last 10 miserable years of life into 15 miserable years of life. And when I say miserable, what I mean, and I hate to sound, because it sounds so callous when I say this, and it, it, you know, obviously I'm, I'm not that old, um, you know, but I, I, look, I look at somebody like my great grandfather who I watched, uh, you know, lay in a gurney for the last four years of his life, couldn't get out of bed, um, you know, literally thought that my name was David, he thought that I was his brother uh, who had died obviously many years earlier. Um, to me, that's not really a life. Um, yet we spend a significant amount of, of, of money in terms of medicine, prolonging lives that, to me, the quality of your life at that point really isn't that great. I mean, dementia runs in my family, I'm gonna be 100% honest with you. I'm like, I, I will have this conversation with my wife and my children when they're older. Like the minute that I start thinking that it's, it's 2020, you know what I mean? And it's 2050, like, just go ahead and stop giving me my medication and let's go. I, I, need, to, I need to be done at that point. I, I'm not living in reality. Um, so we've seen Medicare costs increase drastically. Um, some of the concerns over the welfare state. Uh, again, the Social Security Trust Fund is going to run out. It, it's just an inevitability, uh, especially when the baby boomers retire in mass, which is beginning now. Um, ultimately, there are not enough working people in the United States to account for all of the Social Security payments that have to be made. The reality is, is Social Security is basically a Ponzi scheme, right? Which is a crime. You know what a Ponzi scheme is? So a Ponzi scheme is basically this, right? Like I tell Sam I've got this great idea and I ask him for, you know, $500. And then I tell him like, hey, um, you're going to get back $600, right? But I don't have a great idea. All I really do is then go to somebody else and be like, hey, let me get 600 bucks, right? And then I give the 600 bucks to Sam. And then Sam's like, oh my God, I made money so easily, right? And he goes and tells everybody. And everybody's like, hey, let's give all of our money to Baker because Sam made a bunch of money real fast, really. He didn't even do anything. Basically, Baker just, he had a Baker $500, Baker handed him back $600, just like that, right? And so now I'm taking all this money in and I'm basically like robbing Peter to pay Paul. That's a Ponzi scheme. And okay? that's basically what Social Security is. Because think about it, we created Social Security in the 1930s, right? And all of a sudden we're like, hey, old folks in the 1930s who have never paid into this program, go home, stop working, we're going to give you a retirement called Social Security, right? Well, where did that money come from? 
That money came from the working class at that point. So basically, we're robbing Peter to pay Paul with the assumption that eventually, like, John's going to come around, right? So when we rob Peter, right, now we're going to rob John and pay Peter, right? And when John gets old enough, we're going to rob Steve and we're going to pay John, okay? That's the concept behind it. But ultimately, what's ended up happening now is we've run into this situation where there was too many people within the, the, the baby boomer generation, and we're not going to be able to sustain that. Okay? Um, that being said, Medicare and Medicaid, probably, probably a bigger issue because of rising cost of health care in general. Great question, though. So, like, for Social Security, the people who, like, don't get a job and get the state, like, the welfare money and all that, and do they, would they still qualify for Social Security when they get older? Um, so you can, well, so, like, my sister-in-law, um, my sister-in-law who's, who's 40, she's the same age I am. Um, my sister-in-law got Social Security for oh, about 10 years after my brother died, okay? because there are additional programs within Social Security. Um, I mean, my bro when my brother, my brother died at 23, right? Um, so, they, so, so they, they were married. Um, she was 21. He was 23. Uh, they had a four-year-old daughter. Right, like she was trying to do community college, and I mean, she's got a degree now, and she's fine. Um, but they were able to get temporary assistance through Social Security through like disability or hardship. Okay, some people can get Social Security that way that have never worked, but others cannot. Okay, now conversely, um, take my grandmother. Right, so like my grandfather, my grandfather gets Social Security right now um, because he worked all his life. Right. Um, to my knowledge, my grandmother never had a job, right? Like never, not, not one, never paid nothing. If my grandfather dies first, she still gets social security as a surviving spouse, but she's not pulling social security herself right now because she never paid into the program. Okay. You don't pay any of the Correct. Stuff. So ironically, I will never get social security. Despite the fact that I pay into the program, I will never get Social Security, even if Social Security is still around when I retire. Because in Texas, there's there's basically a weird law loophole here in Texas where I pay into the Texas teacher retirement system, right? Which is TRS. And so it's basically like Social Security just for Texas teachers. And okay? but it allows me to not pay into Social Security. So I don't pay Social Security right now. And so when I go to retire. I will retire and I will draw money from TRS, but I cannot draw money from Social Security at the same time. Okay? Um, and so there's there's some issues around that. Now the reality is, um, I, I'm not even sure I paid into Social Security long enough to qualify. Uh, and certainly not long enough to qualify for, um, you know, full, uh, full benefit. Right, uh, Medicare, Medicaid are, are going to be bigger concerns, though. The, the, the ballooning costs of health care in the United States are astronomical. And health insurance, as a general rule, is a joke. Okay? It is so convoluted and complex that it is ridiculous. Okay? Because health, like, I, I'm a bright guy. I don't understand my health insurance. Literally, I have health insurance that says max out of pocket three grand. And I've had years where I paid six or seven or eight thousand dollars because my child had to have surgery. I'm like, well, how's max out of pocket three grand if I'm paying more than three grand out of pocket? Doesn't make sense to me, right? Um, but Medicare and Medicaid are going to, and healthcare in general, are going to see significant increases. Um, cash welfare um, has basically changed drastically, uh, and there's all sorts of reforms now. With all of this, um, biggest biggest issue here is you cannot you cannot now um, just sort of live off of welfare for the entirety of your life. Um, that that just doesn't work. Okay, uh, there are limitations on the amount of time that you can pull quote unquote welfare. Um, additionally, with our welfare programs, we also have like welfare to work reform issues and programs where we basically try to provide people with job skills. Um, again, being from West Virginia, this is something that like I, I know a fair amount about. Um, 
because you get people all the time that want to shut down coal mines um, and stop that. And so if you decrease, like if you basically if you shut down coal mines, you kill probably 60% of the jobs in the state of West Virginia, right? And so then the question is, well, what do you do with all these people? They were working, right? And now the government like prevents them from working. The government took away their jobs. So what is the government going to do? And the government basically pays to train them to do a different job so that they can get back into the workforce, but it doesn't cost them anything. They'll go into a basic welfare like program so that they still can survive while they're also getting new job skills. And then they go back into the workforce in some other position other than uh, 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 coal mining because, you know, Democrats hate, hate coal, right? And, um, The, there's issues with welfare when, when it comes to uh, ideas and concepts of equality and opportunity um, as well. And, and those, are, those are two terms. Um, and I, I would remind you of the, you remember the reading that you did about liberty, about freedom, about what freedom means um, and how freedom means something different to, to different groups of people in the United States. The same can be true of equality. Equality does not have the same meaning for different sets of people in the United States. Uh, so it's a little bit uh, difficult to, to sort of um, deal with this concept. Um, but ultimately what you're looking at um, is, is you're looking at creating opportunity to give people an opportunity at establishing or, 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 or reaching uh, equality, right? Uh, that's sort of the concept here, right? To open up opportunities to people that didn't necessarily have the opportunities otherwise. Okay? Um, some educational welfare issues, um, obviously like the GI Bill um, is one of them. You can constitute that as welfare. It's a government funded program. So in that regard, it is, it is government funded. It is, there's actually a number that go to the military. Um, and as a veteran, I'll be honest with you, like I take advantage of all of them. Right, like I, I, my college, my, I, I graduated as an undergrad with no debt, uh, in large part because of the GI Bill. Um, some of my grad school was 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 covered by the GI Bill, not all of it, but some of it. Um, you know, I was able to buy a house under veterans assistance um, with loans. Like those are those are our welfare programs. Uh, then again, those are means tested, like you have to qualify for them, I qualify for them as a veteran. Uh, but there are things that are trying to create opportunity, right? Trying to level the playing field for what we know in the United States really isn't a level playing field, right? Um, now we have a whole conversation as to like where the inadequacies exist in the playing field and what is the root cause of them. That is a wonderful conversation that needs to be had in the United States. We're not gonna have it right now. Um, but there are obviously some, some racial issues and some, some social issues, uh, economic issues, uh, cultural issues, uh, all, all sorts of things that play into it. it it's impossible to oversimplify, uh, despite the fact that people try to do it all the time and be like, here is the root cause of inequality or, or, or unequal opportunity uh, in the United States. It's, it's a really complex issue. Um, but so there's been all sorts of things uh, that have been passed, uh, whether it was No Child Left Behind or the Obama administration's uh, education policy was raised to the top. Um, uh, but we've had a significant amount of money uh, provided for education, um, now for higher education. Again, you see Democrats pushing at this point um, for the erasure, erasure, erasing of student loans, um, uh, specifically for um, the, the poorest amongst the United States. Uh, you, you see a push for uh, free community college at least, or some Democrats are even pushing for uh, free four-year uh, degrees for people. Um, as far as healthcare goes, um, again, we've seen some reforms with uh, like Medicare and Medicaid. Uh, the Affordable Care Act um, was an attempt, it had been tried before and failed. Um, in fact, when you go back to 2016, um, Hillary ran around telling people that before it was called Obamacare, it was called Hillary Care. 
She actually wasn't lying, which is a shock because all politicians lie, but she wasn't lying. They tried to do that in the 1990s. Um, that being said, I mean, the Affordable Care Act, as it's written, is, is probably doomed to failure. Um, it's a step in the right direction, um, but the, the rising cost of health care um, really need to get under control before you can do anything else uh, with health care reform. Um, there are some issues with this, though, as well, um, just like we have some inequality in terms of uh, you know, Social Security and, and people who have to pay in versus people who get it out. Um, the Affordable Care Act did create an individual mandate saying that you had to have health insurance. Um, and so for somebody like me, um, I basically went the entirety of, of my 20s without health insurance, right? So I went almost 10 years without health insurance because I'd gotten out of the Marine Corps and I didn't have health insurance from them anymore. But as a single young man, like, I didn't need health insurance, right? Um, the mandate would require that I purchase health insurance. So I would be paying a couple hundred bucks a month for health insurance, despite the fact that I wouldn't use it, right? And that's supposed to lower healthcare costs for other people, right? Like under the Affordable Care Act, I now pay for things like birth control. That's part of my healthcare plan, right? So I, I pay for reproductive healthcare as a part of my health, care, health insurance plan to ensure that in the event that I were to get pregnant, it would be covered. Right. Now, obviously, that's kind of ridiculous because I can't get pregnant, right? Biological impossibility. But I pay for that because it's one of the higher costs in healthcare, and it's one of those higher costs that's sort of a requirement, right? Um, and, and for a long time, it has been disproportionately pushed onto women because they're the ones that use it. In reality, I, I would argue, and this is just my personal opinion, um, because it takes both a man and a woman to make a baby. Uh, therefore, the man should be equally responsible for the healthcare costs of it. So if you force men to pay for those costs, just like you've been forcing women to for decades, and eh, it's probably okay, right? At least in my personal opinion. Um, housing, um, affordable housing, and, and then some housing policies. Um, so you, you might have heard of a term like redlining, um, which can relate to housing. It doesn't always relate to housing, but it's about uh, basically establishing redlining is, is kind of creating uh, white neighborhoods versus non-white neighborhoods um, and, and how we engage in economic policy that differs between the two. Um, in the 60s, 6, I think 68, we passed the Fair Housing Act. I think it was 68, I don't care the exact year. Um, but basically you, you could no longer discriminate in housing. Um, that being said, we do still have some significant issues in terms of housing. We still are predominantly segregated as a society. You go to almost every major city in the United States and you have, you know, Little Italy and Chinatown and, and, and whatnot. In New York City, um, you know, depending on the neighborhood that you go to, it's like, here's the Irish neighborhood, here's the Italian neighborhood, here's the Chinese neighborhood, here's the uh, Dominican neighborhood, here's the Puerto Rican neighborhood, right? Uh, and so that's just some of the, the, the variations in it. Uh, but ultimately we've tried to create policies uh, to, to eradicate that. Uh, because ultimately, historically, what would happen is those minority neighborhoods, property values would be significantly lower. And when we talk, when, when you hear Democrats, you hear people on the left talk about systemic racism, this is kind of what they're talking about, right? Because we, we segregated people and then minority neighborhoods were decreased in value and white neighborhoods increased in value. And then significant amounts of educational funding come out of property taxes. Well, when your property value is low, your tax rate is low, your tax the amount of money that you're paying in taxes is low. So the amount of money going to the schools is low. And so what happens to the schools? Now we have a significant gap in performance amongst the schools. And so all of that plays into um, some of these policies and, and, and who's trying to benefit and who's, um, why some of these policies ultimately need um, to be there, right? Um, so who gets what? Um, obviously, the elderly get a lot of money from Social Security and Medicare. Um, upper middle classes, they do benefit, especially when it comes to like tax breaks um, and things like that. Um, the very fact that we have the, the title of working poor is kind of comical to me, because uh, if you're working, you probably shouldn't be poor, but you know, hey. Um, so the working poor actually generally receive the least amount of assistance because they don't have disposable income to 
write off on their taxes or things like that, but they also make too much to qualify for some of those means-based programs. Um, and then you have really like the poor poor um, who get a fair amount of, of, of general assistance um, and because they qualify for a bunch of those means-tested um, programs. Um, I, I'm not gonna get into the, the sort of demographics um, just because we're really not gonna have time. Um, but, uh, you know, you get into sociology, if, if you ever, like, if you decide you want to major in sociology, or if you look into anthropology, um, I'll be honest with you, like, those are, those are some really good, um, you know, interesting elective classes that you can take in college, um, especially because they really make you think, um, but if you look at, like, the socialization, uh, or, or so, uh, 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 sociology, um, as it pertains to, uh, subsets of the population. Uh, poverty, for instance, is a very feminized sort of concept in the United States. Women live in poverty at a, a much higher rate than men do. Um, and it's due to a wide variety of issues. Uh, you know, when you look at like the pay gap, um, that's one of them. Although to say that the pay gap is just a gender-based thing is really an unfair assessment as well, right? Just like we can't boil everything down to race and that being the issue or whatever, um, you can't do it to gender either, right? So when you look at like, do women make less than men? The answer is yes. Um, do they make less than men solely because they're women? Well, that's, the answer is no, that's not really a fair assessment, right? They make less because a lot of the times they have less education, they work fewer hours, uh, but some of those things are a result of trying to take care of children, especially when you talk about sort of single parent households um, that are far more common um, in this day and age, right? Women are generally the ones bearing the cost of childcare and men don't have to do that, all right? Um, so there you go, so that's, that's it. Um, that is all we're gonna go through today. Um, if you have any questions, let me know. Otherwise, um, when is your, is your test Wednesday or Friday? Friday. Friday. So you'll have your next test on Friday. You've got a short response Wednesday. But yeah, I would I would actually highly recommend um, some some sociology classes. Um, one, because especially if you take intro, first of all, just so you all know when you go to college, anything that says intro to is usually a pretty easy thing, right? Um, but two, you have to take electives because none of you, none of you will. Um